Welcome, and thanks for joining our webcast today. We've been having a lot of chats about cloud migration, and we thought it would be valuable to convene a conversation around migrations and talk about ways to approach the journey. I'm Marquis Lewis, CTO at Unicon. I've been in education technology for a long time, leading teams, delivering solutions to students, often at very large scale, and the cloud has been an absolute blessing in executing on that mission. Joining me today are Dave Mendez, Dave is a senior cloud architect at Unicon with over 20 years experience in many aspects of IT from cloud solutions, network and systems administration, and leading teams. Bill Thompson. Bill is the director of digital infrastructure at Lafayette College. He leads teams responsible for public cloud infrastructure, network systems, IAM, and information security. Bill has over 15 years of experience in higher ed IT, including positions at Princeton, Rutgers, and the State University of New Jersey. Desi Lunsford. Desi is an applications developer at Olympic College with more than 18 years in higher ed IT. Desi is the lead for the Olympic College website, manages content, and works with over 100 authors in the college's Drupal CMS. Thanks so much for joining. You all bring such valuable experiences and stories to the table. Thanks for being willing to share what you've learned. Let's take a quick look at our agenda. We'll cover some ways to get started on cloud migration, talk about strategic approaches, tools and techniques that can be applied, hear some stories about results and outcomes, and have some time for questions. We've probably never had a time in education that required doing so much in so little time. While the initial season teen crunch might be over, we still have lots to do and have much uncertainty in our education mission and institutions. So talking about cloud as another tool in the toolbox is really pretty relevant. The topics here apply to many types of institutions, community colleges, various sized private institutions, and public colleges and universities. Okay, so let's get into the cloud migration topic. Sometimes deciding where to start can be the most daunting part. We like to reassure folks that there are multiple entry points that are valid. These range from purely React mode, tactical needs to full strategy first approaches and options all along that spectrum. Dave, let's get started with the tactical. Often these are smaller migrations, a single application or workload, or a subset of the overall tech footprint that was dependent on a particular piece of infrastructure that might have failed or is at end of life. Can you tell us about a migration that was driven out of necessity? Yes, sure, no problem. Uh, Unicon had to perform an emergency migration of a content delivery application system that was actually being discontinued by the provider. And the provider was going to exit their data center and they informed their clients that they would no longer be providing that software for them anymore. So Unicon was called in to first evaluate the software to see could it be migrated and what would be involved in doing that. After we evaluated the tech stack, a tactical plan was implemented to first determine how to move the application, the content, and its associated database. While doing that process, it was also determined that the tech stack could actually be altered to take advantage of lower cost options available in AWS, replacing Microsoft Windows technology of Windows Server and SQL Server with less costly options. Um, using AWS and their particular migration process of assess, mobilize, and migrate, Unicon was able to successfully develop the migration plan. We were able to test it multiple times without disruption to their production environment, and then migrate everything successfully, coming to a final conclusion of using Amazon Linux, as well as S3 and the Aurora Postgres SQL database service. Cool, thanks for the story there. So uh, what makes these tactical migrations successful? Are there tools and processes that can help? Yes, absolutely. The, the biggest key about tactical migration and, and the biggest part of it, it's all about the planning. There's a, there's a tried and true method of assess, mobilize, and migrate and modernize, three main steps of the process to get to the cloud in AWS. The first step known as assess is getting assessing the readiness for the cloud. If you're not familiar with AWS at this point, it's best to get a partner involved to get assistance with this. In, in case of the previous discussion I just had about a migration, the clients were not equipped to migrate the workload by themselves. So they grabbed a partner to help them migrate successfully. 
Uh, the next step, the mobilize phase, is where you actually create a migration plan. It's important to note that you, you get your details such as the testing process, the time it would take to perform the migration, and the validation processes of your migration. In addition, this is where you begin to identify tools that help you in the process of migration, such as an AWS data sync, the database migration service, or a server migration service. Good tip here to remember when you're in this stage is to find out if you are going to need some, a lot, little downtime that would be required to do the migration. Sometimes that's based on the tools you're using for your migration process and what you have to consider on your end user base as well. Can they afford the long downtime or can it be short? Now, once your plan is in place, the final step is known as migrate and modernize, and you migrate that according to the plan you've developed. It's important to realize that this is where you're testing your actual migration in the third stage. The wonderful thing about migrating to AWS is that you can and you should test the migration multiple times to determine what is working and what is not. The process you then adjust each time and you execute it in a rinse and repeat manner until you're comfortable with the migration that it will be successful. Once you're at that point, you execute the plan one final time to go into production. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Desi, I think you've got a relevant story about a needs-driven migration. Uh, can you share that with us? Yeah, definitely. Um, so with Olympic College, we were on a host that basically became not really cost-effective for us to stick around any longer. Um, kind of a nickel and dime scenario where everything was costing extra just to do some simple things. Um, we it was a shared hosting environment, so we only had access to basically the application layer where the CMS lived. Um, couldn't really do anything with the server, couldn't add monitoring, couldn't add extra tools, couldn't really get in and do anything that we wanted to. And in, in the past, we had an environment that was all Windows based that we hosted ourselves. So we were used to doing everything on our own and not really having limitations to what we could get access to. And with the host we were on, it was just getting more and more difficult to be able to do it. So we, it was time for us to move to something different. We'd already been looking at Amazon for some other um, services that we were working on, things like virtual servers, uh, a uh, virtual backup area, so we didn't have to rely on physical tapes that much anymore. So a lot of the stuff we were working was already towards Amazon and, and AWS. So. We had uh, reached out to our contact at Amazon. They got us set up with a partner. And um, after working with them for a little while, they kind of left us high and dry because they decided to get out of the higher ed market and move on to something different. So got back in touch with our rep at Amazon, and they hooked us up with Unicom. So from there, we started to look at what it was going to take to get us migrated over. Could we have a similar type of environment? Um, and it, it took a bit of effort to kind of get us going in the right direction. Um, there was a lot of uh, discussion on what, what kind of environment we could get. And we actually wound up getting a Windows environment created on top of Amazon that I use as a development environment, which is really nice because it makes it very familiar for me to continue to work in the same environment, but leveraging non-Windows tools kind of in the underlying architecture which is really great um, so we were uh, looking at getting an environment that was really easy to work with something that could be documented real great um, uh, in a nice uh, manner that works with our existing documentation that we use for everything something that I could pass on to other developers if needed and so it kind of worked out pretty well for us. Um, basically in a very good situation right now where it's very similar to what we had before, um, uses some scripts and other tools to manage some things, and I can actively develop on it whenever I need to and then push the code up to production. So it, it's definitely a much better scenario than what it was before. Um, we, can, we also leverage things like the expandability that Amazon just has built into it where we can dynamically increase the size of the database or the servers as we go um, 
you know, obviously only paying for what we use, which is a huge bonus that Amazon gives us. Um, it's much better uptime, um, a lot more reliable. Um, the site probably has never ran as fast as it did, um, as it does now, um, which is kind of interesting because our host actually used Amazon servers for their hosting environment as well, but we couldn't use any of the tools that Amazon had because there was that middle layer of them kind of blocking us a little bit. So now that we're there, it's you know, so much easier. We, we have full control over everything um, the, from the development environment to monitoring to having this wrapped into our existing server management plans with our server admins so they can do, take the backups that we get from Amazon and roll that into the backups for everything else. Uh, it's just a much better environment overall. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, Bill, anything that you'd like to add uh, from your experiences? Yeah, actually, um, we started our, uh, got st our started uh, with AWS on a tactical project. Um, we were facing some storage capacity and capability issues. Um, for a long time, we lacked a sort of a, a tiered storage capability, um, and we're always running into capacity issues. Our, our on-prem storage was mostly deployed to support um, our ERP system, and then we leveraged it for everything else. And so um, it was okay for some things, but we were running into issues, particularly with things like legal holds, state of retention, and archival. Um, and we kept seeing these reports from Amazon, you know, reducing their cost of storage and introducing Glacier and those sorts of things. So um, we finally pulled the trigger. We ordered a Snowball. Um, if you haven't seen one of these devices, it's the coolest thing. Um, they ship via UPS. It's like this ruggedized uh, NAS device. It looks like kind of like a big PC. And um, we plug that into your network. We transferred about 50 terabytes of data. Um, lock it back up, call UPS, they pick it up, take it back to Amazon, and before you know it, you got 50 terabytes um, on S3 that we were able to quickly transfer over to Glacier. Um, it was a big win for us, um, freed up our one print capacity um, and reduced our overall cost for data retention and archival. Um, ended up being like a really easy first use case since it mostly involved infrastructure folks mm -hmm. um, and a small set of people. And um, so we started with a single AWS account with limited access, allowed us to get our hands on AWS and build some confidence and expertise. So it was, a, it was an easy early win with a uh, you know, very well-defined scope and uh, helped us get, us get us going. Oh, that's a great story, Bill, thanks. As a contrast, let's look at uh, maybe the polar opposite, the fully strategic approach. Um, the drivers here can be much different tightly aligning to the organization's mission and go forward strategy. Uh, perhaps there are initiatives that require rapid growth or scale, such as launching an online program um, or some innovations in teaching and learning that are gonna require dynamic inter iteration and experimentation. Uh, there's a lot more stakeholders involved in the strategic approach. You've got to work to align across technology, finance, administrative and academic leadership. Um, Dave. We'll cut over to you again. Um, what do the phases of a strategy-driven migration look like? Sure. So a strategy-driven migration, when you're considering an all-in approach, it involves the same three steps of the assess, mobilize, migrate, and modernize of, of the migration process in AWS. However, they're, they're a lot more detail-driven. Uh, primarily, there's a lot more focus placed on the organizational aspects uh, that, that you had just mentioned. Moving all into the cloud, it requires input from various stakeholders across the organization instead of perhaps just a few that may be working with a single workload. Uh, power of the planning still is, is considered the same way you go about doing it. So planning with the various stakeholders is vital to the success of the migration because you start to gather all of the input from various people, from the finance, from student retention, from alumni, that those types of areas, you're grabbing everything that you need from people to get into the cloud so that nothing's missed. Um, the assess stage involves an organizational review around the readiness of an organization to move to the cloud. To help you out with that, there's a tool that is free to use known as the Cloud Assessment Readiness Tool, or CART. 
and it helps you assess everything for getting ready to move to the cloud. It'll involve looking at certain areas such as your business needs, the people involved, your current processes, the platforms you have, your operational status, and the security of all of your IT infrastructure. Uh, using the tool, you gather your strengths and weaknesses of your organization, and as well as to be in a position to find the business case for moving to the cloud. Uh, this stage allows your organization to put into place what is known as a cloud center of excellence, which is a group of people from these various areas that help transform the organization into more of a cloud-centric organization using these key individuals to foster change. It's where you can grab input from others and determine standards and, and start to bring the whole organization in to play the move in the cloud instead of just a few people for a certain workload. In the mobilized stage, you handle things such as discovering your applications, you begin to detail out your cost, you refine business cases for your move to the cloud, you start to organize all of your resources and develop migration plans for your applications, starting with your less complicated ones. And you begin to determine timelines for what you would like to accomplish. The final stage, the migrate and modernize, is where you begin to take your lessons learned to scale out your migration process. That's why you start with this less complicated one so you can gain knowledge from those and then you're able to scale out. And you begin to take advantage of what's known as a migration of factory approach where multiple teams begin to operate concurrently in the process. Uh, when using this strategy, if you're familiar with AWS or how to migrate, it's often advantageous to work with an AWS partner who can provide you guidance and assistance with the entire process. Cool, great, great overview, Dave, thanks. Um, there are some best practices out there, possibly folks have heard of the six R's of Bob migration. Um, Dave, could you walk us through those? Yep, absolutely. So during a, a migration process, there's six R's. They consist of different ways to migrate your infrastructure and applications into the cloud. The strategies are typically assigned during the mobilized phase when you're doing application discovery. Each application would fall into one of the R's, giving you a plan for how to migrate the application into AWS. Uh, the six R's are as follows. And the first one's called rehost, which is basically lift and shift. Pick up what you have, put it in AWS as it is. The second R is known as replatform, which is known as a lift and shift with a little bit of tinkering. Uh, repurchase is the third R. That's where you decide with your application maybe to remove it and go with more of a SaaS offering. A good example is maybe you move to a SaaS authentication provider. Uh, the fourth R is known as refactor. And that's where you actually change your application to be more cloud native. And that's usually driven by business needs to scale out or add new features during the process. Uh, the fifth R is called retain, which is where you're not going to do anything with that application at this point in time. And the sixth R is known as retire, where you decide to just get rid of the application. It's not going to stay on-prem or go into the cloud. Um, ironically enough, now that AWS has partnered with uh, VMware, there's actually what's known as a seventh R that's coming about now, known as relocate, which involves moving your near sphere based applications to AWS without any sort of application change. So it's sort of like lift and shift, but it's specific to the vSphere technologies. Um, during your application phase, and perhaps with information you gather from tools like the AWS Application Discovery Service, you kind of determine the proper strategy to assign to a workload and put a plan in place based off that that assignment. Uh, it's important to always realize, though, that what are you assigned to a migration workload is not set in stone. That assignment of a plan, it's, it's subject to change. It's just to get you started. And it's okay, to be honest, I've seen quite often where things are discovered during the migration testing process. Uh, you know, examples are I've seen applications that had a local caching, like a memcache or a Redis cache on their actual box, and they were going to lift and shift that in the rehost strategy. And after going through a couple of tests, they decided that, you know, I could use the AWS Elastic Cache service instead, and it moves to a replatform strategy. So they, they replace that and take it with it just a bit. Um, all of the six R's are standard and accepted strategy across the cloud providers. Um, they just help you define the strategy for each application you will migrate. Um, it's important to note that these are not for just strategic uh, migrations. You apply them to tactical migrations as well. It's just with one workload, right? You figure out how, what's the best way to move this workload, which R can I apply to it for. 
um, it, it helps you if you're doing one-off ones or whether it's just a single workflow. It helps you just to find a process that you'll use and give you an idea of what to expect from your migration, like in, a, in our strategy. Got it. Thanks. Um, so th there's a lot to keep track here. Um, you got infrastructure, application portfolio, discovery going on, things in the corners that, that people forget about. And then, you know, all of these dependencies where, you know, you've got uh, shared infrastructure, Bill, you, you mentioned, you know, leveraging storage that was primarily um, over here for that application, but some other, other people piled onto it. Um, pulling all that apart can be a real challenge. Um, you know, and sequencing matters here too. So Dave, um, could you tell us about some of the tooling that's that's available to assist here? Yeah, absolutely, and it can. It, it, if you're not familiar with, with migrating the cloud, it can get very overwhelming if you don't understand the tools that are available to help you through your, your journey. AWS offers you numerous tools. Um, they help you follow the steps for the migration process. There's tools for the assess stage. There's tools for the mobilize stage, the migration, the modernize stage. If you look at the assess stage, they have what's called the AWS Migration Readiness Service, which is available through AWS or AWS partners to help you navigate your CART tool assessment or provide even a more detailed CART service uh, to dig in deep into your readiness for the cloud. Uh, during the mobilized stage, the AWS Migration Hub, it's a service that provides a single location to track all of your migration tasks across multiple AWS tools and maybe partner solutions you're using. Um, you get to choose and pick which tools best fit your needs while gaining visibility into the status of your migration projects and where are they at in a certain part of the process. Um, the AWS Application Discovery Service, that's a service that helps you automate the discovery of your servers, your workloads, their dependencies. It collects information about running processes and network connections, giving you more information for what to apply to your strategy, what are to apply to it. Uh, during the migration stage, you have tools that actually perform these for you, right? There's the AWS Database Migration Service, the AWS Server Migration Service, AWS Data Sync. They help you migrate and automate stuff such as databases or your virtual machines or even your data itself, as Bill mentioned, the Snowball, in the AWS. There's tools to help you do all of this. You're not alone in that process. Um, one particular service that's really good that has picked up speed lately is called the AWS Cloud Endure Service. That's a service that will allows you to simplify and ex expedite, reduce your cost of cloud migrations by offering a highly automated lift and shift approach. So it keeps it, it, it performs all of these tasks for you, lift and shifts your, your workloads in the cloud and almost does a flip, almost an AB flip to, to your new system inside of AWS after you've tested it multiple times. Um, remember, there, there's, there are tools to help you with what you need to do and, and help you decide what to do during your migration journey. Um, it can start small and it grows larger as you gain experience with migrating. The tried and true pattern of migrating is get your experience, find out what's going on with your workloads, and then start to scale it out. That's tried and true, and that usually leads to successful migrations. All right, great. Th thanks, ton, Dave. Um, so. I'd like to hear from uh, Bill. I think, you know, you've got from your initial workload migration, you know, centered around storage and getting your feet wet. Um, you know, as I understand it, you've kind of evolved a little bit here um, and you're somewhere now in, in sort of a strategic approach. Um, where are you and, and what's working for you? Yeah, indeed. We have kind of went all in on AWS. You know, after our early success, you know, we really sort of had uh, three primary drivers. One was that we had an aging and somewhat brittle and expensive on-prem infrastructure that we knew needed to be modernized. Um, so we were facing down that already. The other second one was sort of a SaaS as a forcing function. A lot of the applications uh, that we were self-hosting were already migrating to SaaS, and so this was creating an integration challenge for us, and we were looking for our new integration platform and the sort of tools that Amazon continue to bring to market uh, look very attractive to us. And thirdly, and I, this is sort of a borrowed phrase, of course, but um, we, you know, we figured you really can't fight gravity. Um, we were looking at container-based deployments, so we needed a container orchestration, but we didn't have kind of appetite or time or funds to deploy one. 
we were getting used to paying for value and what you use with Lambda and Glacier and other AWS services. So there was less appetite for paying for idle capacity. And, and finally, we really wanted to enable builders and our solutions hosting teams. We did, I think, a fair job of managing our on-prem infrastructure, and um, but it was fairly static in terms of the kinds of capabilities and even capacity that we could provide folks. And so we really wanted to kind of get out of that and switch to a more agile uh, method of managing the overall infrastructure for the college. So after a few early wins, uh, we were able to get the green light on a wholesale migration to AWS for our self-hosted solutions. This was supported uh, by an engagement with CloudTronk and AWS that gave us some idea of our full full in costs that we could compare to our historic analyzed, annualized cost for one prem. Cost wasn't the primary driver though. Um, we understood that we needed to get to a modern deployment strategy. And you know, the infrastructure team, we didn't want to compete with the cloud providers, nor do we think we could compete with the cloud providers. You know, we have uh, kind of a joke internally, like no one wanted to be, nobody wanted to be the last guy racking and stacking the server on the campus. So we knew we needed to pivot how the infrastructure team provided value to the college. And, um, and for us, that really kind of boiled down to a phrase that might sound familiar, but we wanted to take care of the college and take care of each other. And what that meant was providing value to the college, learning to, and learning together um, how to manage this new uh, paradigm. And that ended up being really motivating and a galvanizing force uh, for the team. It was, it was fun to experience and watch. I think critical also was um, we did establish a cloud center of excellence. We did partner with Unicon, which was critical. And also I have to really call out our excellent support from our AWS solutions architect, Fernando Ibanez. He's been with us from day one and has really been uh, key to our success. And of course, our support from our accountant, uh, uh, Courtney Fish. They really tuned in to higher ed and have been super responsive, which has been really helpful. But I'd say our biggest impact strategically, though, has been two things. One, we adopted a multi-account strategy, which was enabled by AWS Control Tower, and our overall public cloud infrastructure management approach, which we've sort of evolved um, organically as we gained experience and um, expertise in, in managing the public cloud infrastructure. So I'd like to share with you just a little bit of our management approach briefly. It has three components. One is a cloud custodians team. And the cloud custodians team is a, a straight up IT service management team. They've got operational responsibilities, routine service requests, they deal with incident response. The cloud custodians are responsible for the underlying network fabric in AWS, security, identity and access management, billing management, all the things that from a solutions hosting team perspective, you don't really want to worry about. You want that provided for you. You want to focus on hosting your solution and have somebody else you know, worry about how we get network connectivity and do we have the right security alarms and controls in place and how do we do billing management? So that's really what the cloud custodians team focused on, enabling the solutions hosting teams. Second component is really our center of excellence. We call our the cloud deployment committee, <clears throat> the CDC. Um, and they're responsible for reviewing our deployment architectures, providing feedback and guidance to solu our solutions hosting teams. And what we're really trying to do with the CDC is balance enabling the solutions hosting teams to make decisions and move forward and innovate. But at the same time, we want to be moving together so that our solutions have a similar shape and feel and that we are able to support them in a holistic way and, and make sure that the cloud custodians are providing the right services and support. And that's actually been working really well and has brought together teams and staff that hadn't really worked together before in a, such a direct way. And it's been um, really great to see. And the third component is the solutions hosting teams themselves. And they end up being responsible for the deployment and operation of the cloud infrastructure specific to their solution which is also a change and posture for us. Before the infrastructure team was responsible for all infrastructure deployment and operation, but now the solution hosting teams also have a responsibility, a shared responsibility there. So this management approach has been a huge help in helping staff understand sort of new roles and responsibilities, how to engage each other and how to engage the college. The second component of this is really 
AWS control tower and multi-account strategy. And that's what underpins the management strategy and key to making it all work, providing consolidated billing and security hub, common networking, consistent account creation and lifecycle, security controls, et cetera. This is what enables the cloud custodians um, to operate as a team and provide that service to our solution hosting team. And uh, it's really working out great. So, so far so good. We're about, I'd say a year into a full on migration and we've got maybe a year and a half to go. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks so much for uh, giving us some insights into, you know, how you've approached this and, you know, really importantly, how you've, you've organized your team and the roles and responsibilities to, to support each other and support your mission. Uh, that's some really great stuff. Um, I want to shift a little bit kind of in that direction, because um, at the end of the day, it, it really is all about outcomes. Um, you know, what problems have been solved? or what opportunities realized because of your cloud migrations. Um, you know, just sharing some of my own experiences in a prior life, um, close to a third of my organization's capacity was just spent on keeping up with scale. Um, you know, every year we were building out data center space, increasing core network capacity, though you mentioned server rack and stack. Um, you know, the, the CapEx investment as well to keep up was just enormous. And in that spirit of, you know, pay for what you use, a lot of our capacity was idle outside of the academic year. Um, and then, you know, of course, we actually over-provisioned some things to accommodate um, various kinds of uncertainty in our capacity. Um, and just so much of that goes away with cloud. You know, so again, building on the, you know, where, where have you gotten to in your migration? Um, Bill and Desi love to hear some of your outcomes. Uh, Desi, I'll turn it over to you on you know what you've been able to accomplish. So our biggest thing is, so our website is basically like the doorway. It's the, the portal that our students come in and access all of our services through. Without the website being there, it's almost impossible for them to be able to get to all the different resources and services that we have uh, available for. Um, and, you know, from a student perspective, one of the hardest things is trying to figure out just what you're supposed to do. You know, you, you've got guidance counselors and advisors in high school that are helping along the way. But, you know, that's just one category of students. You know, that's just a high school student getting ready to transition into college. What about things like veterans or international students or those that are returning to the workforce, maybe they're, they've are they been downsized and now need to get new skills and, and change their career a little bit. So there's a huge you know, variety of different types of audiences of, uh, of students that, that need to figure out how to get into school and what, what are the steps that they have to follow. So having the website there, making sure it's reliable, that they can get to it, that it's, it's always available um, it gives them the ability to get to all those different resources, you know, financial aid, the, the registration system, you know, transferring from a different school, uh, getting into the learning management system, getting to their instructors, uh, the, the uh, uh, bookstore services, the, you know, even our, our residence hall for a lot of the international students that we get. So without the website being up and reliable, you know, it's, it's, difficult for them to be able to get to what they need to. And, you know, the, our, our goal in higher ed is to get students to where they're successful. And so all of this technology, all of these resources that we have out there, it doesn't do anything if they're not reliable, if it's not something that you can count on being there and making it easy. You know, it's hard enough being a student. Why should we create any more artificial barriers for them? So, for us, transitioning over to Amazon on, on the AWS from a system that we couldn't really count on. You know, there in our old system, there was actually a few periods of time where our website was down for multiple days at a time. And it was nothing but frustration for everybody, not just us that trying to get it back up and running and the people working at the college, but the students themselves. It was you know, just your worst nightmare, not being able to, to give them the resources that they needed. So uh, with us being on a better system now, something that's reliable, that can grow as we need, that can be there, you know, 
it's, it's a helping hand for students and that's the, the biggest thing we can do is just help them along the way without any extra hurdles. So it's, it's been a huge, huge benefit for us to be on a system like this. Thanks, Desi. That, that's just a, such a great reminder, especially now that um, you know, eliminating barriers for, for our students, you know, when they, especially when they've been um, pushed into, you know, remote learning situations that, that further add the difficulty of doing what they need to do to achieve their education goals. That's a, that's a great reminder. Bill, I think you summed that up well with the take care of the college, um, take care of each other and, uh, you know, keeping the, the focus on on the students and what they're trying to accomplish is is the is what we're trying to do at the end of the day. So that's that's great. Um, Bill, anything to add here in terms of the outcomes you've been able to accomplish? Yeah. Um, well, so I mean, one aspect you touched upon, which is um, you know the amount of time that we used to spend just dealing with sort of capacity issues and the scale. Um, and uh, agree, cloud has just been amazing in that area and indeed, in fact, liberating. Um, you know, we're able to scale up and down uh, workloads at will for many of our workloads that have already deployed to AWS. And, um, and so it just, just flips the equation around completely. Um, helps us make better decisions about capacity since in many cases we can auto scale. We can take down infrastructure when it's not needed. You know, you think about dev or test. Um, and uh, more recently, sort of a quick story around our web single sign-on solution. We had uh, moved that up to AWS. We were very excited about it. It's been working great. We had auto scaling configured. Um, we ran into our first uh, registration uh, period, and uh, the first class that came on board, um, we ran into some uh, issues. Um, it stood up, although it didn't behave in the way we really wanted it to. Um, and very quickly within, within, you know, the next day that we're on campus, we were able to spin up a fairly large, um, uh, test and stress infrastructure in AWS. Um, we were able to prove out, um, and iterate on our, uh, auto scaling configuration. And three days later, we had a new configuration and the next registration class went through without a problem. Um, and uh, afterwards, we were able to scale back down to sort of our normal um, run rate. So, you know, it's just amazing to see um, both the flexibility and agility of being able to do something like that, which we wouldn't have been able to do in the past, but also the cost effectiveness. Like once we were done with this load test and stress test, we just turned all that stuff off. So that was really amazing. Um, so I think we're seeing that. We're seeing improved reliability and lower operational burden. If you look at things like, Container orchestration with Fargate, uh, RDMS management with Aurora RDS, or, or even just simple things like the certificate manager. You know, we, we had a process and a policy on how many hours spent making sure our certificates weren't going, uh, uh, at a date before they were renewed and, um, getting them from free and having AWS manage that process automatically has just been, uh, a real game changer for us, actually. Um, so we're, we're really, uh, the other sort of thing I might mention also is that, um, and this wasn't really sort of anticipated in the beginning, but as an outcome of the multi-account uh, strategy that we have, we can now very easily and precisely report out on the cost of self-hosted solutions. It's really quite amazing. I can tell you down to the penny what our web single sign-on solution is costing us from a self-hosted perspective. I could have never told you that before. I would have had to you know, just kind of guess because it was all running on shared infrastructure that was primarily deployed and, and, uh, sized for a different workload. Um, so it's really kind of eye opening and, um, just kind of a great outcome for us. Um, and then finally, you, men you mentioned sort of the COVID-19, the thing that we're looking at right now is, um, AppStream, um, which is a new service, a uh, relatively new service from AWS, uh, to support a high flex campus environment. Um, really, this is a continuing strategy for us to provide services to students, faculty, and staff anytime, anywhere, on any device. And um, we're excited about um, what AppStream is going to be able to do for, for the students uh, come this fall semester. Great. Those, those are awesome stories. Thank you, both Bill and Desi. That wraps up the presentation and discussion portion of today's webcast. So now we'll move over to taking some questions. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, first one up, uh, what is a good workload or application to start with to get our feet wet? 
Um, I'll toss that out to uh, uh, to our members here. Yeah, I can answer that one. Uh, it's Dave. In general, most of the time, the when they try and find a good workload or application, it, it helps the client knows the application itself very well. That's usually the ones that we see people get started with, whether that's a, a website or a small processing application, a storage move. Uh, the key is that the team understands the application itself to be migrated because that lets them focus more on like a rehost, lift and shift migration to get experience with the process and allows the team to become more familiar with the AWS migration process itself. If something happens, they can easily look at the application with the internal knowledge and, and know how to fix it or see what's wrong. And they focus more on the process instead of is the application working or not because of something we did. It, it, it lets them focus on that. So an app that you know very well is always a good one to start with. Got it. Great. Um, Desi or Bill, anything you want to add? Uh, I could add a little bit on that. Yeah, this is Desi. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for us, obviously, is our website um, lift and shift, moving it from one host to another. Um, and I had very specific requirements to go along with that because I wanted it set up a very specific way to kind of emulate what we had before. Um, and so it uh, it took a little bit of, of extra work to try and figure some of that out because, uh, you know, Amazon has a lot of different underlying services, there's different processes, different different ways of doing things that you don't normally do on a regular, just full server, obviously. You know, there's services rather than server kind of in a way. And so it, it involved quite a bit of creative um, effort to figure out how to do some of these things. And it's amazing what is available in AWS. Just, you know, I just kept throwing things at Unicon um, you guys were great at coming up with, you know, solutions on how to do this. And it was like first time things, you know, it was something that's never been done before, but, you know, managed to get it done. And, um, you know, on my side, I've been trying to learn as much as I can, um, Amazon related, you know, I've done several different courses on my own. I've got a subscription to, a the, uh, uh, a site that does a lot of different training that covers everything you can imagine to try and get people prepped for the different certifications and things like that. Probably a little bit more than the direction I want to go with, but um, you know, for us doing the website was, you know, a very good test for us to be able to, to show what we can do. Cause like I said, everything I threw at it, it was able to do. And, we have a lot of applications that we host locally that I can imagine we're probably going to wind up moving up to the cloud as well. Great, thanks. Nice. You know, for for Lafayette, um, you know, I mentioned the early movement for uh, data retention archival. Um, to me, that's an easy one. You know, it's not particularly end user facing. Um, Moving static websites comes off up a lot, and it was true for us too. They were fairly easy to move over and kind of low hanging fruit for us. Um, but the, the maybe the third one, which maybe seemed uh, maybe uh, a little bit risky, but for us it wasn't. And I think it speaks to Dave's point about knowing your application. Um, we were able to deploy. We run the trusted access platform from InCommon, so the web single sign on component is called Shipalift. And um, they're already packaged in Docker containers. Um, and so that deployment architecture just lends itself really nicely uh, to an AWS deployment. Um, and we were able to do that uh, fairly easily and um, very happy with the outcome. Um, and, and now, in fact, AWS uh, has reference architecture for deploying uh, those kinds of workloads. So I think, um, you know, there, you can focus on the low risk stuff, but also if you're, solution that you're self-hosting um, is already made a movement to um, sort of cloud-based architecture to make it really, really easy to, to get done. Great, thanks. That's great, Bill. Okay, um, another question coming in. Um, we Boy, we see this one frequently. Oh, That's a great question. I need to bring my team along. We've tried some small things in AWS, but we don't have all the skills we need. 
but I also don't want to outsource migrations and be left in a situation where I'm completely dependent on someone else. Uh, what approach can I take? I'm going to hand it off to uh, some of our folks, but as I mentioned, we hear this question a lot of it's so critical to develop um, the skills uh, in your team. Um, it's so hard to attract and retain uh, uh, technology staff these days that you've got to factor in that that um, uh, that component of your employees and and your team members along the way. Bill, I'm going to I'm going to go back to your quote of um, take care of each other uh, as being an essential part as you think about your uh, cloud migrations here. So this is a fabulous question. Um, anybody want to jump in here on this? Yeah, I can start off against Dave. Yeah, first of all, that's a really good question. We do see that a lot. Um, I do see, to be honest, the best approach is you definitely don't want to outsource your migration. The best approach is usually to grab an AWS partner or someone familiar with the migration process to give you as needed help. Um, we've worked with clients quite a bit that take that approach where they use Unicon as more of a support partner in case issues are discovered or advice is needed during their process. It allows the client to handle all the work, gain all the knowledge, but have that that fallback of someone with experience that can answer questions, provide help if you need it, and that lets them train themselves to have someone readily available to help them if they desire that. So that's what we usually see. Yeah, got it. Um, uh, Bill or Desi, you want to jump in here? With anything else? Yeah, I would. I would agree. I think um, you know we talk a lot about. Uh, core competencies and, you know, how do we add value to the college, both in infrastructure and in uh, IT division generally. And um, it was really important for us um, to uh, to do the migrations ourselves, in fact. And um, but we wanted to, you know, not do it alone and, and not make uh, common mistakes or mistakes that would come from lack of expertise. So I think for us, it was really a combination of partnering with Unicon and again, our solutions architect at AWS, where we really felt confident that um, we were moving in a good direction. We could um, bounce ideas and do architecture reviews and get feedback um, and course correct as needed. Um, but also, um, you know, in the way we've done uh, our solutions hosting team and our, our cloud uh, deployment committee, um, you know, we've we've taken it kind of a step by step, you know, fashion. You know, we've, you know, learned to crawl before we started walking, and and I think we're at a pretty good uh, jog right now, and and be running, uh, almost running, I suppose, already um, over the next year and a half with the rest of the migrations. But um, you know, you you build up expertise um, fairly quickly when you've got, uh, I think, the right dynamic of uh, teams supporting each other. Um, in support of the mission of the college with the right with the right partners as a backstop. Yeah, and on our our side, um, so we're we're a fairly small IT department. Um, I mean, we're we're you know a, a community and technical college, so we're not huge. Um, but we've got uh, we, we do a lot of crossover within our kind of on the higher end of, of our IT. Um, a lot of us take multiple roles. We try and get involved more as a team on most projects, even if we don't have any direct involvement. It's more just making sure everybody's in the know of what everybody's doing, so that way we can have some fallback if we need. Um, and you know, it's we we try and do as much training as possible. We've we've all attended some different classes, things like that. But when it came came down to it, we definitely took advantage of a partner with, with Unicon. Um, and I know that we'll, we'll do more in the future as we look at other projects and moving other things up into the cloud. Um, but we've, we've tried to keep a good crossover of things with, internally from our kind of different, uh, the server side, the application side, database side, um, you know, even customer service side, all of the different houses within IT have all tried to keep on board with each other so that way we're we're fully supporting each other along the way and there's you know try and limit any single points of failure you know just like you do with an application or, or with anything um, so uh trying to 
do that internally has, has helped us quite a bit because we can ask our own questions internally and kind of develop our own knowledge base. And then if we have to venture out, you know, we've got a partner that we can work with as well. So it's kind of kept us a little more well-rounded that way. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Um, got another question here. We have a complicated infrastructure. Shared resources in terms of storage, backup, network, security infrastructure. So lots of dependencies. Um, even starting small presents a lot of challenge in dependency management. Any way to deal with that? Um, so yeah, great, great question. Um, you're trying to pull all the, the pieces apart and figure out where to start sometimes is, um, uh, is not easy. Uh, I'll toss it out to, uh, Dave and Bill and Desi and, and see what uh, insights you guys have. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I usually see that problem with a lot of all-in migrations. Um, in situations like those, the assess stage of the migration process, that's extremely key. Um, planning becomes very important with complex infrastructures or, or situations like that. Um, that's where having that cloud center of excellence or the teams that have come off of that, that's where that becomes vital because you get the right people involved to make decisions and identify dependencies and provide some valuable information. Uh, once you have that information, you can then start with a small workload and, and try to adjust as more and more migrate. But communication and, and the planning of those migrations, using a tool like the AWS Migration Hub to provide a central place for everybody to look at and analyze what's going on and see the state of each migration, that, that's very helpful. So it, it's all about the planning. Planning is very, very important, and, and having the CCOE helps with that. Apparently, it can be very daunting to someone who isn't familiar with it. So that's my advice on that one. Got it. Great. Thanks. Um, Bill or Desi, any, uh, any suggestions here? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that comes to mind um, for us, a couple of general strategies, I think the, the one thing we've really tried to do is for the self-hosted solutions that we've migrated, we have really consciously tried to isolate them in terms of their deployment. So they do use common um, network, particularly, uh, and security infrastructure and account management lifecycle that the cloud custodians provides. But in terms of the, the resources that the workloads need, we've really tried to focus on um, providing infrastructure per workload. Um, so you're kind of untangling as you go. Like, so for mm -hmm. instance, you know, we had, you know, we had a, a, a managed database service on-prem, right? We had a MySQL, MariaDB cluster um, that had, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen applications that used it as a service. Well, every time we move one of those applications, you know, we spin up its own RDS instance in its own account. So um, that's one way where you start to kind of detangle kind of in a stepwise fashion. Um, other ways we've tried to address that is um, with transitory or uh, you know, migratory, uh, capabilities or components that we know, um, you know, is not long lived, but helps us sort of with a hybrid deployment, um, while we move some of the components, you know, forward. So, you know, we might have some networking bridging or we might have some DNS solution in place that, um, we need right now because some of the components are in both places, but we know that once we're fully cloud, deployed that, that those components will melt away. So we've got some technical um, like approaches to, to try to also start to detangle and um, um, reduce some of those dependencies. I'm going to pile in on, on one of your comments there, Bill, um, you know, about that shared database cluster. Um, you know, it's funny that in our on-prem environments, you know, we, while we were all looking to find ways to um, you know, reduce costs, share infrastructure, leverage the talent and people that we had. Um, you know, we created these dependencies yeah. to bite us in ways, you know, that we might not have anticipated. And um, as, as you described, you know, being able to break those dependencies apart, um, it, it creates agility for you. You can, you know, things aren't tied together in ways that were, um, you know, somewhat arbitrary in the past. So, um, I just wanted to kind of amplify that point of there, there's a lot of freedom you can gain in this process as well. Thanks. Um, good stuff. You know, and I, I also want to add in that there's 
you know, if you look at it, there really is no such thing as a simple infrastructure. You know, it, as soon as you have more than one thing running, it gets complex very quickly. Um, you know, even with something relatively simple with just a website, you know, that is, is static. Um, you know, we use single sign-on for that, and that has to integrate into our existing uh, network and still tie in with all the other various services that all leverage that as well. And, you know, each one of them is kind of unique in how they connect in, but they all still have to work. So, um, you know, kind of, you know, documenting things, making sure that you have a really good understanding of how it all works before trying to move it is, is a huge help um, because you don't want to miss anything along the way. And I mean, those will obviously surface as you as you get going. But, um, you know, it's like the, the, the question, you know, you know, about where, where do you start? You know, it's it is difficult sometimes to figure out where to start when you've got something that is pretty complicated and especially things that you have customized to the point where, you know, how do you replicate that? You know, that that's always one of those things that you have to, it's kind of a fear in the background is can we actually recreate this thing someplace else? Um, so uh, having the tools that AWS has, I mean, it's, you know, like I said, it's earlier, we, we threw everything we could at it and it still works. So it's um, having the right platform to move into is is definitely, you know, one of the, the things that you want to look at first. Can Amazon do it? So far, you know, I've, I haven't said no. I mean, it, it definitely does everything we needed to do so far. So, and, I, and our stuff is pretty simple, you know, even though there is nothing that's actually simple. Um, but, you know, getting, getting everything documented, getting all laid out, having a good understanding of how it works uh, in the existing um, infrastructure you know, will definitely help figure out if you can get it to work in some other structure moving into to the cloud or something. So, it's, yeah. All right, good stuff. Thanks. Okay, another question here. Uh, here we go. You didn't really talk about hybrid as a migration strategy or a desired end state. Um, does that fit in here at all? Um, I'll toss that out to our uh, to our folks here. On the on the webcast, anyone want to take that? Sure, I can. It's Dave again. Um, a good question. Uh, the my, the hybrid migration strategy, usually I see that classified as mostly as an end state. Uh, usually to get there, people are performing tactical migrations, which is what we're we're discussing here today, um, where the applications or a workload is migrated into AWS. And it's a combination of both having things in AWS with your data center, right? So you're technically in a hybrid state when you're doing all-in migration where some stuff's in AWS and some stuff is in in your on-prem data center there. Um, it's more of that end state. People combine cloud native solutions with their tactical migration workloads. Uh, you still plan and account for your dependencies in that because you have to work and make sure things are going to talk to you with connectivity between the two areas. But um, again, that's the communication between team members uh, that are that are working those two areas is, is vital, whether that's through the CCOE or, or just a small group of people. But that's usually what the hybrid is. I usually said it more as an end state, not so much as a strategy. Okay, thanks. Great. Yeah, I think something similar uh, is true for Lafayette. I mean, I think the way we think about it is, you know, into the previous question about the tangling dependencies. So um, I think our first order of business is trying to get workloads deployed in AWS and AWS that don't have a hybrid or an on-prem dependency. And if we can do that, we feel much better about the deployment. Um, but um, there are situations where, you know, as we talked before, there's some sequencing that sometimes happens where, you know, you just can't move everything all at once. And so you may have some solutions that are um, hybrid in nature um, only because you're still sort of walking through um, your migration. So we have cases like that. And then I think finally, I think we will end up with still some hybrid solutions out of necessity, but not as a, essentially as a strategy. I've seen um, some, we've seen some other schools, some other deployments where um, they take hybrid as a strategy for failover or redundancy. And I, 
it doesn't really sort of jive with, I think, we're, where we're going or the experience that we've had with AWS. I think we're much more inclined to have uh, rely on AWS infrastructure for that sort of thing rather than um, a hybrid um, um, architecture. Yeah, and on our end, we're we're kind of hybrid just because we have to be on some things right now um, as we're learning more about Amazon in general, um, as we're slowly moving things into the cloud, as we're uh, changing processes that have traditionally been on-prem to things that can work in the cloud. We're moving pieces and parts as we go rather than just kind of all in and, and having everything up there at once. Um, you know, some of our systems, just because of the type of organization that we are, we can't put in the cloud. It, they just, it's either external data sources that we connect into to bring information in locally, or it's things that, um, based on just the requirement of how it works, it has to be physical. Um, you know, we're, we're getting fewer and fewer of those scenarios, but, um, you know, we have, some things where we're, we'll need to surface data that comes from something else, and then we use the local stuff as kind of a transit point for it to go from one to the other. Um, and we'll actually be looking at hopefully getting some of that moved up to AWS with a, you know, like a dedicated VPN that's on all the time, so that way the connection point can be open, um, but secured as well. So. Um, yeah, it just it, it kind of depends on what it is that needs to move, um, whether it can go all at once or um, whether it's you know strategic in the pieces and parts that we do, or or if it's something that just by nature of how it works will have to be hybrid in the end. I, mean, I know we're we're kind of a mix. We're we're a little bit of everything, um, and got some definite plans in the future that are going to be hybrid just because that's just how they work. And it's, yeah, not much we can do about it, but I know that it'll work a lot better in AWS than, than some of the other things that we've tried in the past. So definitely looking forward to that. Great, thanks. Yeah, there's there's stuff on campus that just has, has to run on campus. So great uh, great points from uh, from you both, Bill and Desi. Thanks, about, thanks for that. All right, another question here. We've moved a few workloads to the cloud, but I'm concerned we don't have a great foundation that I can't really move more apps into our environment or I'm gonna end up with a bunch of one-offs that are all different and I end up with a management nightmare. Um, how do I take what we've done, really make sure it's solid and ready to expand the scope of what we're trying to do in the cloud? Um, great, great question. Um, I know, uh, uh, Dave, you've got some perspective on this, Bill, um, I'll bet you're going to chime in here with uh, your multi-account strategy stuff. So I'm going to kick it over to you guys. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's actually a fairly common scenario that I hear quite a bit about during people moving to the cloud. Um, what I usually recommend and what I usually see put in practice is if you have some one-offs and you've done them or you're in the process, kind of halt things at that point right? because you do want to get your foundation in place. That That's very key, especially as you're going to be especially if you're going to go to an all-in, right? You need to have your standards in place to handle security or logging. There's there's a lot to think about at that point. Um, so definitely, I, I usually recommend just kind of halt. It doesn't mean to stop the month. Just halt for a little bit so you can take stock of where you are at currently, what you want to accomplish. It's far easier to do that now than later on down the road. Um, and then it, it's time to get the AWS account structures in place, whether that's with Control Tower uh, or AWS organizations. It, it, there's things to start to implement and look at. So once you have that in place, which you'll want to put the time in, it makes life a lot easier once you have it there, then you can start picking things back up and, and migrating things into that type of environment that can implement more of a tactical migration for any existing workloads if, if you have to move them into this sort of account structure. So that's usually what I see. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, June uh, 24th, 2019 is seared in my memory because that's when AWS Control Tower finally GA'd. Um, we deployed on June 26th, uh, 2019. 
Um, and we had uh, been looking at an account, multi-account strategy with uh, Control Tower's predecessor, um, the landing zone business. And, um, you know, I remember in January or December of that year, sitting through a three-hour seminar on uh, landing zone. And the very next day, Amazon announced uh, Control Tower as a service to be released in 2019. And so we did exactly that. We put, we pumped the brakes. Um, we knew we wanted to have uh, a framework, a structure um, that we could consume more as a service from AWS that would help us um, do the kinds of roles and responsibilities that the Cloud Custodian team is doing for us at Lafayette. Um, and that's really that's really worked out um, extremely well for us. And uh, so I couldn't agree more. I think you've got to get um, the right technology in place, which I think Control Tower does a very good job. Um, a few other things like the organizations and Security Hub also help in that area. Um, but probably the more critical thing I think in my mind is, um, you know, you can have the right tools, but if you don't have the right team or the right structure, um, it can be very uh, challenging. And I think one of the things I'm most so grateful for, and not only of the team that we have at Lafayette, um, but they're willing to um, help evolve and um, figure out where the roles and responsibilities were going to be to fall and what the right structure was for us to take care of the college and take care of each other. And, um, and that's worked out really well. So I think even with the right tools, you can still have a lot of challenges. So you've got to really focus on both. Yeah, I, I definitely echo that. Um, having, having the right team, um, having uh, working with a partner to help figure some of these things out. Um, you know, it's that kind of old saying, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, you know, it's, we already have full-time jobs working in IT. You know, we, we have our skill sets. We have our daily things that we have to work with all the time. It's, it's hard to become an expert in a new technology, um, especially something as vast as AWS. Um, so getting the right people on the team that, that can help you get to where you want to go is just absolutely huge. And, and we couldn't be more happy with you know, working with Unicon for this, for everything that we've done. And our stuff is fairly small, what we've worked with so far. I mean, it's, for us, it's a huge project, but in the overall scheme of things, they are pretty small with what we've done so far. And we, we have plans for quite a bit more. And, you know, we're definitely learning as we go, but we're going to tap into other people as we need because I, I can't see us doing it alone. Um, as, as good as our team is, again, we're small, um, so having having a good partner is definitely a, a a big big asset for us. Great, thanks for uh, uh, thanks for that, and thanks for the the kudos. We really appreciate it, and we've loved um, working with you guys uh, as well. Um, that wraps it for uh, the time we have today. Um, thanks again. Thanks to uh, Desi and Bill, especially for coming in and sharing their stories. Um, and thanks so much. <laughs>